Young men, this past Friday, the football team, uh, I had actually brought them a piece of this message on having the heart of a champion. Before you go out into that field, to have the heart of a champion. And I talked about David and Goliath. And as I finished that message and some things that had happened this week in my life, uh, some, some things that had happened that, you know, trusting in God's faith and trusting in His power, um, it, it reminded me that no matter who we are and what's going on in our life, we need to have the heart of a champion. Are you with me, church? I don't care whether you're facing uh, challenges on the football field or whether you're facing a challenge in your life, it's important for us to have the heart of a champion. How many of you have ever had your world rocked? Yeah, anything ever happened that rocked your world? You ever got a phone call, it's like, whoa, dude, really, serious? And it can rock your world in a heartbeat. You know, it's easy to say that you have a heart of a champion until there's something that happens in your life and your faith is tested. Amen, church? So this morning, I want to talk to you about having the heart of a champion. And if you'll go with me, please, there's several verses. In fact, when I sent a portion of this outline uh, to Deanna yesterday, in fact, it was just finished yesterday, about 12 o'clock, as the Lord had made the adjustments on this message. So I want you to know that the message that you're getting this morning is Holy Spirit filled. All right? Holy Spirit filled. All right? It, it started with a football team on Friday. And I got to be honest with you. Uh, yesterday, as, or last night, as I was watching uh, the Florida State and Clemson game, you know, Florida State wasn't supposed to beat Clemson, and they tore them up. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you that uh, the heart of a champion, and I watched the interview with that young Winston yesterday, uh, this young quarterback, here's a freshman quarterback doing some amazing things. I'm not here to talk about football, but what I'm, I'm here to say is even the underdog can win. Amen. And sometimes we're the underdog, amen, church? And you have to have the heart of a champion. So this morning I want you to look at the key verse that the Lord has for us. It's actually found in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And this is what it says. It says, be on alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. We're going to miss Sean. He's getting ready to head off to work. I, I need to share this with you. We were praying... Uh, as I think about Walmart, uh, now I don't promote any place. I just don't do that. But uh, uh, Tony Stewart had touched base, the, the manager over there, uh, about a TV that they were getting that actually had the little codes and stuff that we needed on the back of it for our worship center. It was just coming off display. And we got that thing for like nothing. I mean, we got that thing dirt cheap yesterday. The Lord provided right at the time that we needed it and got the phone call on that. So. Uh, anyway, Sean's headed to Walmart to go to work, and, and while he's there, he witnesses to folks. Amen, church? He witnesses to folks. If you've ever walked in and, and uh, had and been blessed by Sean, it's just an amazing thing to watch how God is using him there at the workplace. He's a champion for the Lord. Amen? All right, so he says in his scripture here, Paul is talking, he says, be alert. How many of you need to be alert every day? Yes, we need, if you're going to have the heart of a champion, you need to be alert every day. Amen, church? In fact, Paul also goes on and he gives us and he shares with us, we had a whole uh, vacation Bible school on the armor of God, did we not? And kind of amazing, uh, one of the things that happened this past week, uh, uh, Friday when I got a chance to speak to the football team, and i got to share with you, that was just so much fun for me. I had leftover bookmarks that we had from vacation Bible school. One was the sword of the Lord and one was the shield. And that was part of the message, you know. And, and I, I laid those leftover um, uh, bookmarks down there. When I finished, I said, you guys can have these. And the coach looked at me and says, well, you already knew. I said, knew what? I, had no, I have no idea what he's talking about. And John, I, they have a sword and a shield on the field? I, I didn't know that. So that was God's divine intervention for them to have that. Isn't that amazing? By the way, you guys won 40 to nothing that night. Something like that, right? So, of course, 42, excuse me, 42 to nothing. I had nothing to do with it. Amen. Nick made a touchdown. Praise the Lord for that. He was attentively listening, by the way, during that message. Be alert. Stand firm. We need to be alert. Amen, church? Because it's more than just being on the football field. We need to be alert in life because things will come our way that will rock our world. We need to be ready for it. Amen. So when it comes, it will not be a surprise. We will be ready for it. Our faith will be strong. Our faith will be solid. So when it happens, we say, okay, Lord, you're going to get us through this. We'll make it through this. So he says to be alert. And then he says what? Stand firm. That when your world get ro gets rocked, whether it's a physical issue, whether it's some financial issue, whether it's something that is going on in the world right now. You can stand firm and say, hey, listen, I'm not worried about this. Because the Lord said He is what? He's the author and the finisher of all. 
We know that He is in control no matter what happens. So I need to stand firm in my faith, as Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 16, 13. And then he says, act like men. Now, I love this part. You, some of you ladies, well, what does that mean? Act like men. I'm not a man. Well, the generality here is, in other words, don't go whining about it. If you're alert and you're prepared and you're standing in your faith, when these things happen, don't go whining about it. Amen, church? Amen. Thank you, Brother Jordan. I appreciate it. <laughs> but you know what we want to do when things happen? We want to what? Oh, poor me. I can't believe this has happened to just me. I'm here to tell you that there's not one thing that's happened in your life that hasn't happened to somebody else. And I'm telling you, God will put in your path those that have experienced or are experiencing what you're going through. He will put them there just at the right time to get you through it. Amen? Amen. To, to grow your faith. So he says, act like man. Stand firm. Be in your faith. Listen. Don't whine about it. Sometimes I think you just have to say it is what it is and move on. Amen, church? So he says, stand firm. Be in your faith and, and act like men. And then he says, be strong. Be strong. Amen, church? Be strong in our faith. Now, that's just the leader for this message this morning. I want to give you a few examples. In fact, we put them on the screen for you this morning. You all remember Noah? God has given us his blueprint. And I shared this the other, other day with the football team. And I'm going to get to David in just a moment. But I wanted to share just a few others with you as we look at God's scripture. And I'm going to pull these from the Old Testament right now. And God may, for another message down the road, we'll look at some of the champions in the New Testament. Paul being one of them who wrote 1 Corinthians. And he talked about the armor of God. But I think of Noah. Noah is one of my heroes in the Bible. He is one of those that had a heart of a champion. There was Noah that he was out there. and In fact, his whole family was, was really the outcast. Uh, if you think about it and you look at the scripture, God is ready to destroy the world. And he tells Noah, go find those that are willing to come into the ark and save themselves from the annihilation of the world because of the wickedness and the sin that's taking place. Noah stood firm. He was strong. He was alert with what was going on. He was listening to God. He had the heart of a champion. He didn't allow his surroundings to take him down or to degrade him or to defile the word of God. So what did he do? God said, I want you to go build an ark. And I can just imagine we've had this conversation before, church. But Noah had to have said, Lord, okay, I'm going to do it, but what's an ark? Never had an ark here on the earth before. Never needed a boat right here because there's no water here, Lord. And the Lord says, build an ark. I'm going to tell you how to do it, and you keep doing it until I bring the rain. And Noah, day after day after day, did what God told him to do. Never wavered on it. Never questioned God. He did what God told him to do. And when the time came, Noah took all those animals they were supposed to bring on the boat, and he brought his family in. And guess who shut the door? Not Noah, but God. Noah was faithful to the call. Noah had the heart of a champion. He was in a place and a time when he and his family alone stood for the Lord Jesus Christ. He stood for God. Amen, church? He had the heart of a champion. Who do we have next coming up there? I think we have Moses. Now, here was Moses. First and foremost, to even understand who Moses was, you have to understand something about his family. During that time, the king was having all the children killed, and she did what no mother would have ever done, and that was to take her and put her baby in a basket and put him in the Nile River and have him float down the river, praying that God would intercede. But God had already had a plan because God is the author and the finisher. God already knew what he was going to do with Moses. He already had a plan for Moses. And I'm here to tell you today that God's got a plan for you. God's got a plan for you. That's why the Word of God says for us to be alert, to have the heart of a champion, to, to keep our eyes and our ears open for what God wants to do in our life. Some of you this morning are sitting there and you're trying to figure out, well, what does the Lord want me to do? Well, I will tell you this, that the Lord wants you to get up out of that seat and ask Him. Say, Lord, what is it you will have me to do? And I will promise you, He will show you. He will reveal it to you. Some of you have gifts and talents that the Lord has blessed you with. Those are His gifts and talents that He wants you to use for Him. Amen, church? I don't know what your gift and talent is. Maybe one of you in this room is an incredible electrician. Maybe God has a place for you in his service to help out as an electrician. Maybe you are the best. By the way, tomorrow we will be stripping the floors again at the church. Maybe you are the best floor stripper that has ever, and, and we never knew about it. Maybe you worked in maintenance before and you said, well, Marty, I was a floor stripper at one time. I will be there tomorrow to be the best floor stripper for the Lord of the world. Let's make sure we understand what floor stripper is before we leave this place. I'm talking about a machine. All right. All right. Floor stripper. All right. Here we go. I have to be very careful about what I say, you know, because people get running away with this stuff. I'll see it on YouTube and they'll put something else with it. All right. Maybe the Lord, maybe you worked in maintenance and you know what? You're the best toilet scrubber in the world. God has a place for you. I don't want you to ever think that what God has blessed you with in the talent is insignificant in his house. 
Whatever you have, God has blessed you with it. Use it for His honor and for His glory. Amen, church? So here was Moses. And God had already placed upon his life what he was going to do with him from a very child and pulling him out of the Nile River. So there's so much more to this story, but I'm going to get to fast forward here just for a moment. He's out in the wilderness. He'd already been outcast uh, from Egypt. Pretty much, you know, down in his dumps, you know, tried to, tried to help out the Israelites. And, you know, he, so he's already been taken out of the king's court. He's been thrown out there in the wilderness. And all of a sudden he walks up and there's this bush burning. But it's not being consumed by fire. That's just an amazing thing how God does things. And sometimes God will do something and show you something in your life that it's only He that can do it. Are you with me, church? Amen. I've been asked so many times, does God still speak to us today? Yes, God is still God and God still speaks to us. Amen, church? Now, He may not take a bush and, and have it catch on fire and not be consumed by fire. He may not do that today. Although, I, man, I tell you what, I would love to see it. I say, Lord, I got all kinds of bushes and trees in the house. Would you light one on fire and not let it burn just so I can see how cool that is? I want to experience what Moses did. And then, Lord, when you do that, I want you to say, I am here. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd freak out if that happened, man. So you can imagine what Moses must have thought. Moses, as God was speaking to him to this burning bush that's not being consumed by the fire, he tells him he's going to use him to deliver the Israelites. An amazing thing how God used Moses to do that. Amen, church? A champion, a heart of a champion. You know, he did what would, we would think would be incredibly impossible, but he had the heart of a champion to do the impossible. You see, God has something for you today that may look impossible, but he wants you to have the heart of the champion and do the impossible because you can do it through him. My notes say this morning that we can't do anything in our strength. I don't care how powerful, how tough you think you are. It is through the power of God that we are able to accomplish and do the things that he wants us to do. Little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Have the heart of a champion. Who's our next one we have there? David. Well, this is really what I want to focus this morning. This is part of the message that I shared with those young people. If you go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, please, if you'll turn there, 1 Samuel chapter 16, there are so many verses that I believe God wants us to see. First and foremost, I need you to understand that even when you were formed in your mother's womb, God had a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. Now listen, I want you to understand this. God has a plan for your life, but He also gives you free will. Amen, church? God gives you free will to choose. And we have consequences of all those things that we choose in life. First Samuel chapter 16, I want you to notice in verse number 1. Verse number 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, and Deanna's going, I don't have this. I know, Deanna, I got so many things. That, oh, there it is. Wow, you pulled it up there. Incredible. Here we go. Uh, now the Lord's first Samuel chapter 16 verse 1 it says now the Lord said to Samuel how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel now we all know that Saul later became king and, and so on and so forth but here's what what the Lord's telling Saul, uh, Samuel he says for your horn uh, fill your horn with oil and go and I will send you to Jesse now Jesse is the father of David I need you to understand that he says I will send you to Jesse for I have I have selected, notice what the Lord says here, He says, I have selected a king for myself among His sons. I want you to know something that God had already, already determined who the king of Israel was going to be, and it was going to be a little boy named David, who Samuel hadn't even met yet. Are you with me, church? Now here's where I want you to go with this. God has a plan for your life. It's, it's already determined, but you, you make the choices because you have free will. How many of you have asked yourself, God, what, it is, what is the plan that you have for me? How many of you even care what the plan that God is and has for you? Ask Him this morning. Say, Lord, right here in this place, I want to know, what is the plan that you have for me? I want the heart of a champion to do your will. Now, I want to just back up just for a moment. I want to back up just for a moment. And, uh, and, and I want you to see just a couple of things here. In Psalm chapter 78, David wrote this. He said, He chose David. This is something that David wrote. He said, He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought him to, the she to, uh, to be the shepherd of his people in Israel and his heritage. And David sh shepherded them, and the integrity by his heart, with skillful hands, he led them. Now this is David as what God had given him to write in Psalms. So now we're going to kind of go backwards just for a moment. I want you to notice something here 
In John chapter 16, verse 33, you don't have to look at all this. It says, these things I've spoken to you so that you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Take courage. I have overcome the world. Now this is what Jesus said. We're going to see in just a moment that he is our great champion. Are you with me? So if we seek God's will and what he has for us, we can overcome the obstacles. We can overcome the world. Now as you continue in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I want you to notice something else here. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want you to notice this, where you see what the Lord tells Samuel to do. He says, Samuel, I want you to go to Jesse, for I have already selected the king that I want for Israel. Now you have to understand that Saul has already become king. Saul's the king. So Samuel goes and he goes to the, to the house of Jesse, as you notice there in 1 Samuel. I believe that's uh, chapter 16, verses 11 through uh, 13. Or 11, yeah, 11 through 13. I'm going to paraphrase all of this for you this morning because it's a very long story. He goes to the court, goes to Jesse's home. And he says to Jesse, Samuel says to Jesse, he says, I want you to get all your sons and bring them, uh, bring them in here because he wants to offer a blessing to them. So what happens is, is Jesse goes, now Jesse has eight sons. How many of you have, anybody in here got eight kids? Who's got more than one? Who has more than two? Now well, let's be honest, let's be honest. When you have that first child, Brandon, there's pictures of him everywhere. Am I right or wrong? Everywhere. Then you have the second one. There's some pictures of them somewhere, right? And then you have the third one, and maybe a fourth one, and then you, people will come over and you'll start showing the baby pictures, you know how we all do? And then they'll all go, well, where's pictures of, of the youngest? And you go, well, well we don't have to have pictures because he's right here. <laughs> right? Come on, let's be honest. Isn't that true? So, you know what? The Bible is, is, is just as applicable today as it was then. So here's Jesse with his eight kids. You can just see Jesse's going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then Samuel says, but if you look at the Word of God, it says, Samuel says, but you have another son. Where's he at? And, 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 and you can just see Jesse going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, yeah, David. David, get in here. David was out where? He was out with the sheep. He was tending the sheep. Little 16-year-old boy out there tending the sheep. He brings David in. The Word of God says that Samuel walked over to David and anointed him and said, God has placed his hand on you. God has placed his hand on you. You will have his power, the heart of a champion. Then the Word of God goes on in chapter 16 and 17. I want you to take time to read this this morning. It's very important that you do this. In chapters 16 and 17, we note where the boys, and I shared this with a football team, so John, you're actually getting a double dose of this message today. So, the sons of Jesse, along with the Israelite army, is going to face the Philistines in a battle. Battle royale, you might say. So, uh, uh, David stays home. He's tending what, folks? The sheep. He's a shepherd. All right. So, the other boys, they go off to battle. They're going to face the Philistine army. Now, you can only imagine that the Israelite army probably takes the biggest, best, and the toughest. That's why David, the little boy, was left at home. Amen, church? Now, as I was sharing with the football team, I want you to think about life. If, if you face an obstacle in life, you want the meanest, biggest, baddest, and toughest thing that you have to deal with that problem. Amen, church? You're not going to send the little squeamish thing there to take care of it, are you? You're going to take the meanest, baddest, and toughest thing there. You're going to do whatever you can to knock out that problem. So here they go to take on the, uh, the uh, Philistine army. And as they stand before the army, you can just imagine, and I was sharing with the football team, it's kind of interesting, if you think about the scouts that go out. Then probably the Israelites sent out a scout and says, we can whip them, we can take them. Be good. And so they all line up and they're getting ready to face the Philistine army. And then all of a sudden what happens is, is uh, this one big dude, nine, the Bible says, if you look at it in his word, it says he was nine feet, nine inches tall. His name was Goliath. Now here's what's interesting, and many pastors skip over this part. The Bible says that Goliath came out and in front of him was what? Anybody know? In front of Goliath was who? See? See, you missed that part. It's important that you not miss it. In front of him was the shield bearer. Y'all see that? Yeah, okay, the shield bearer. The shield bearer. Now think of something about a shield bearer. Now I don't know about you, if, if he is nine feet, nine inches tall, Goliath is, how big do you think the shield bearer must be? I mean, if he's going to hold the shield to protect this part of his body, he wasn't a little munchkin guy. I mean, he, there, there wasn't Goliath, this little dude walking around holding a shield. I mean, he, that ain't happening. I would dare say that the shield bearer was probably as tall, maybe not as wide and as big, because Goliath was huge. But if he was going to hold the shield for Goliath, then he must have been a big dude too. Are you with me? 
So you, can you imagine, just imagine, now listen, the heart of a champion, can you just imagine, here comes Goliath, and in front of Goliath is a shield bearer. Are you with me, church? Now, the Israelites, again, as I shared with the football team, talking about football just for a moment, I said, the scouting report, somebody messed up. Right? I mean, somebody messed up on the scouting report. Nobody, nobody picked up on the fact that there was Goliath and the shield bearer dude. You know? And, and you can just imagine the Israelites are looking and going, oh, wait a minute. That's one big dude. Where'd he come from? You know? Who missed him? Or them? Are there any more like him? That would have been my question. Well, they put all the little munchkin guys up there first, and then all of a sudden, here comes Samson, or excuse me, comes uh, David, or excuse me, uh, I'll get it right here. Yeah, that's right, Goliath. Out comes Goliath. I mean, I've got so many messages going through my mind right now. Out comes Goliath with his shield bearer. And uh, the Israelites, how many of you would say they're a little nervous right now? Yeah. You think they have the heart of a champion right now? No. How many of you think they're scared? Yeah. You see, how many of you ever got that phone call and you thought it was going to be something, but it was something else? And then all of a sudden, the heart of the champion became the heart of a coward. Has that happened to anybody but me? See, I'm just like you. I'm just like you. And you say, Lord, I don't, I don't know if, 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 Lord, right now, if I have the faith to face that, I don't know if I can deal with that right now. See, I was expecting this. I thought this was going to happen. I thought this was going to be what, what the issue was, whether it's health, whether it's fine, whatever it is in your life, church, listen to me. Sometimes you will get hit with the unexpected. The Bible says that we're to be alert, be ready, stand firm in our faith. Are you with me, church? So the Israelites, what were they doing? Hey, we came, the scouting report was great, we were going to win this battle, and all of a sudden we look out there and there's these big dudes. We didn't expect that. That's not the report that we got. Therefore, what did they do? Let's regroup. Let's huddle up. Hold on. And not only did they huddle up and decide what they were, or try to figure out what they were going to do, what happens usually when we face the problems of life? They taunt us. Do they not? It's kind of like, oh, come on. Have I mean, you ever been just kind of been dug at by one of those little issues that just never quits, just keeps coming after you? Well, that's what Goliath did. Goliath stood over and said, hey, you guys, you guys want a little bit of this? Come on. Come on, take me on. In fact, not only did he taunt them, but he began to defile their God, our God. He says, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to have every one of you today. You need to read it. Chapter 16, chapter 17. Well, the Israelites were huddled up. Instead of having the heart of a champion, they had the heart of fear. They had the heart of a coward. See, God said he was going to deliver them, but they didn't believe it. God ever said that to you? I'm going to take care of this. You're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. Your faith is strong. And then you go, I don't know, God. I don't know if you can really do this. this. This is pretty big stuff here. Listen to me, church. You listen to me very carefully. I still serve a God of miracles. I still serve the God that created the universe. I still serve the God that causes this big blue marble to remain in the axis and remain in the space that it needs to and spin just at the right amount of time so it doesn't sling us off this thing, all right? Now, although that would be kind of cool to see that happen. I mean, I don't know, you know. Let's spin the world up today and see what happens. <laughs> but God does it, and He does it in perfect harmony because He's God. You see, He'd already told them they would defeat, they could win, but they didn't believe it could happen because the obstacle looked too big, looked too tough. So they were huddled up as, with a heart of fear and a heart of a coward. Well, like any father would do, Jesse says, David, I want you to go check on the boys. See how things are going over there in the battle. So what does he do? He says, put some food together. I want you to take them some food. So David turns in to be the errand boy to take food to his brothers and to check on so he can get a report back to dad that the, that the, the things are going well. Amen, church? So David gets his food, and he goes on his way to hook up with his brothers and the rest of the Israelites over there. Now, when David gets there, he sees something that David had never seen before in his young life. What did he see, church? Help me out. What did he see? He saw fear. He had never seen that in his brothers before. He gets there, and he sees them all huddled up. And, and, and you can see it as you read the word. Why, why aren't you guys taking care of the battle? I'm paraphrasing here. Why, why, why isn't this battle going on? And then as he is conversing with his brothers and checking on them and trying to figure out why they're not battling the Philistines, he hears in the background Goliath doing what? 
Yeah, challenging them, taunting them, ridiculing them. You know, you get that problem, just keeps coming after you, coming after you. Are you with me? Now, David, I don't know whether he was a typical teenager. I don't think so. I think the Spirit of the Lord came through David at that very moment. And David stood up and said, What do you think you're doing? You are not going to talk about my God like this. How dare you? Now, Elib, the oldest brother of David, the Word of God reports this. You need to read it. Elib, his oldest brother, grabs him and poof, pulls him over and says, Are you crazy? Well, actually, are you crazy is not written in the Bible. I'm paraphrasing for you. He says, you, you, you can imagine what's going on here. He's pulling over, and the Word of God says that he was angry. Read it. The Word of God says Elib was angry with his youngest brother. Because why? Because he was ticking off the giant. Now listen, he is okay over there. We don't want him over here because we need to get a different game plan together. The game plan we have probably isn't going to work. So don't go ticking him off, David. Isn't that true? You ever faced a battle, ever faced a challenge in your life, and there were the naysayers around you that said, God's not big enough to take care of it, or God's not big enough to do it? You ever faced those people? You see, I want, to surround my, around, I, I want to surround myself by those that have the heart of a champion for God, not those that have the heart of fear and the heart of a coward. Because my God can do anything. So if you want to come up to me and say, well... I just don't know if God's in it. I don't know if God can do it. I know He died on a cross and He can save our sins and He got eternity and all that cool stuff, but I just don't know if God can do that. Please don't come talk to me like that. Are you with me, church? Because my God can do anything. Amen. Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The Word of God says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if you want to come around and frown and whine with me that my God can't do anything, I'm going to pray for you that the Holy Spirit just gets a hold of your life and just changes you. Amen? Amen. So here's David, the heart of the champion. David, as he says to Goliath, you're not going to talk, my God. You're not, you're, not going to, you're not going to say those things. You're not going to defile him. Well, Saul hears this, the king. And he comes over and says, boy, you can just imagine this. Boy, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, th this is not a good thing. I mean, what makes you think that you can take this giant on? Read it. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and chapter 17. And Saul says, what do, what do you think you can do in taking on this giant? Well, I mean, what's going on here, David? Now, David says this. Read it. Read it, folks. David says, now, I'm a shepherd boy. Now listen to me very carefully, church. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the good shepherd. He's the great shepherd. And you know what? Those pictures that they show Jesus, he's holding a staff and there's that beautiful little lamb there. It makes Jesus look very meek and very mild, doesn't it? Did you know one of the toughest things you could do in your life was be a shepherd? Did you know that? There's nothing meek and mild, although he is because he has the tenderness in taking care of his sheep. But I want you to know something. He has to have a heart of a champion. He needs to be a warrior. Did you know that? So David says, I'm a shepherd boy. And he says, listen, I need you, I need you to know something, king. You see, th there was a time when, when the, there was a lion that came running in the pen. And he grabbed one of the sheep. And he, as he was leaving, he had the sheep in his mouth. And he says, I went and I took the sheep out of his mouth. And he said, when I took, is it sheep or lamb? Anyway, he took the sheep out of his mouth. And he said, when the lion would come back to me, he says, I killed him with my bare hands. Read the Word of God, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 17. David gives this story. He says, I killed that lamb, or that, uh, that lion with my bare hands. And he said, then there was a bear. A bear came into the, into the fold, and he took one of the sheep, and he says, when he had it in his mouth, I took it out of his mouth, and he said, I killed the bear with my bare hands. Now, I don't know about you, but being a shepherd must have been a really tough job. Amen, church? He protected those little lambs. When something would come to take one of them, he what? He would fight to the death to save the sheep. Now let me tell you something. Jesus is the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Jesus loves you so much. He died on a cross for your sins. He took your penalty for you. That's some pretty awesome and powerful stuff in my book. I don't know about yours. So David tells this story to Saul. And Saul says, whoa, one tough kid. One tough little boy. 
David or Saul says to David, he says, we're going to suit you up. So they get all the guys over there and they start putting all the armor, all the, the, the battle regalia onto David. So much so he kind of sinks down. And the Bible says he couldn't even walk in it. Read it. It says he could not even walk in the battle regalia that they put on him. So he begins to take all of it off and he says, I don't need all this stuff. He says, I got a sling. And he goes over and it says to the wadi, that's a little riverbed. He goes over, he scoops up these rocks and he puts them in his pouch. And he goes out to the front line. I call it the battle formation. He goes out to the front line and there is the giant Goliath. Think of this. These are all the problems in your life. How many of you have gone up to the front line and said, you will not defeat me? David says, I come to you in the name of the Lord. Today, I'm going to win. Today, I'm going to have your head. Any of you ever faced your problems like that? Any, every, every, anybody ever had the heart of a champion and said, you know what? Today is the day I come to you in the name of the Lord. Well, just like all those problems do, that giant looked over there and he saw David with his sling and those stones. He says, boy, read it. He says, you come to me like a dog with some sticks? You're going to play with me? Is that what's going on? And then David says, no, no, no. I come to you in the name of the Lord. I can just picture, <laughs> I can picture Goliath standing there. And the rest of the army, they're, just, oh, oh, they're laughing at him. Can you all see it? Can you visualize it? Just like everybody laughs at us when we're facing things and certain things going on in our life. And so we know, my God is powerful. My God can do this. Yeah, okay, sure he can. Sure he can. So you just picture that Philistine army. They're laughing at David. Goliath's having some fun with this. You going to play with me like a dog, boy? Is that, you're bringing your sticks? You coming to play with me? I come to you in the name of the Lord, David says. You just picture, he reached down in his pouch, he grabs one of them rocks. The Bible says it was a smooth stone. He put it in his sling. You just picture him twirling it. And I can just picture Goliath going, take your best shot. And I can picture the armor bearer, or, or his, his, uh, his, 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 uh, his uh, shield bearer, I can picture him just going, go let, let him hit him in the chest. I mean, my big can, he's not going to hurt him. It's a little rock. And David just, and, then, and it catches him right here. Right there. Now, I'll tell you right now, there's not any of you, I don't care how big Sam is. Sam, if I take you out in the parking lot today and you stand still long enough, it may take me a, a dozen rocks, sooner or later, I'm going to hit you between the eyes. And I will promise you, Sam, how big you are, you're going down, dude. <laughs> Amen, church? <laughs> Amen? I don't care how big, how tough, how ugly. Now, I just put the ugly part in there. You're not ugly. But <laughs> I don't care. I don't care, because I think Goliath's probably an ugly dude. But I don't care. You are going down. Amen? Amen. I'm here to tell you something. God is so powerful that I don't care how small you think that stone is that God can use, how insignificant that you may think you are, God can use it and God can use you. David was just a shepherd boy. David just had a little rock. But God's power was enough. It wasn't through David's strength, it was through God's power. Well, he knocks Goliath down with that stone. Boom! He falls and hits the ground. Now, I can only imagine the Israelites, you know, they were probably all huddled up when David walked out there, and they probably had David's brothers, and they were going, man, that's one tough brother you got. Too bad he's going to die today. You know, I can just picture them doing that, you know? And then all of a sudden, they look up, and boom, the giant goes down. What does David do? Read the Word of God. The Word of God says he walked over and he pulled out the sword from Goliath's sheath and he stood over and cut his head off. That's awesome. And then he picked his head up. That's kind of grotesque, but I, listen. <laughs> but, you, but you have to understand the power of God. Not only, listen to me, in Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, they became my life verse, and I'm going to paraphrase for you. It says, when I was down in the pit, God reached down, and He pulled me out, and He set my feet on a solid rock, that whoever sees that may fear Him. Let me tell you something. When God does something powerful in your life, people will see that it, it can only be God. It can only be through His power that that happened. And it says they will fear Him. They will understand the awesome power of the God you serve. Are you with me, church? That Philistine army saw the awesome power of God. And the Israelites conquered. Amen? Amen? Only through a boy 
named David. Now, I want to take you to the next part of the story. I want to share with you about the greatest champion of all. And if we'll go to those slides, the greatest champion of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice in that verse I shared with you again, in John chapter 16, verse 33. And Jesus says this. He says, these things I spoke unto you. He's, he's talking to us, church. He says, these things I speak to you, so that in me, Jesus says, in me, you may have peace. See, church, I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know what's going on in your life. But today you can have peace. I don't know what you're facing. You're never going to have peace in the world. You're never going to have peace until Jesus is in you. And Jesus says, through me, you can have peace. Notice this. He says, you can have peace. Jesus goes on and he says, you see, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. It's going to be tough, folks. It's not going to be easy. What does Jesus say? He says, take courage. Take courage. He says, take courage because I've overcome the world. Now, let me tell you something, church. I want you to understand this very carefully. We do fear from time to time. I believe it's through those fear that God brings our courage and causes our faith to grow. And then he reminds us that, hey, listen, no matter what happens here on the world, in this place that you're residing in at this moment, this temporary home, I've overcome all of that. How do I know that? Because even to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You see, no matter what happens here, I know that I have another home. And that's an eternal home. Amen, church? So, no matter what happens, I can have peace. No matter what goes on in this world, whether it's a political thing or whatever, I can have peace because I know He's overcome that. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, listen to this. It says, But Christ was faithful as a son over His house, whose house we are. Notice what's being said here. But Christ was faithful as a son over His house. He was faithful to do what the Father had called Him to do. And the Bible says that as a follower of Jesus Christ, He says, we are in His house. Amen, church? As a follower of Jesus Christ, I am in His house. And He says, if we are in His house, we can have confidence. Amen, church? We can have confidence and boast in our hope with firm until the end. Why is that? Because I'm in the house of God. I can rest in the assurance and the promise that He has for us. One more verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I want you to listen to this. It says, Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. He is set down at the throne of God. This verse simply says that Jesus went and He endured the cross. God sent Him to die for our sins, for yours and for mine. It says, for the joy. I'm going to tell you right now, there's no joy in hanging on a cross. The joy was in knowing that Jesus Christ was the conqueror. The joy is knowing that Jesus Christ is the greatest champion. He died on a cross for your sin and for mine. He overcome. He overcame what this world threw at him. He overcame what Satan hurled at him because he's God. Amen, church? The greatest champion, the champion that we should look to, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I wrote in my notes this morning, I want to share this with you, that Christ is the perfect example of who we ought to emulate, who we ought to strive to be with the heart of a champion. The Word of God gives us many that are applicable to today, many challenges that we face, and how these great warriors of our faith, these great champions of our faith faced examples for us that if they can do it, we can do it. But the greatest of all was the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our shepherd, the great shepherd. He completed the task at hand that the Father had sent Him to do, dying on the cross for our sin. He arose on that third day and he's seated at the throne of God. He was obedient to the end. How about you? Having the heart of a champion is being obedient to the call, doing what God asks you to do, even when it gets tough, never quitting. You see, when you face the battles of life, you can either quit, you can either be the victim, or you can be the victor. 
I wrote in my notes that Jesus Christ endured the agony of the cross, the shame of the public crucifixion, and the burden of our sin that was placed upon Him. He conquered death. He overcame the grip to reclaim the, cr the throne with His Father. Though Jesus Christ had the power of the universe in His hands, He remained humble and submitted to the will of the Father with a heart of a champion. And Jesus Christ emerged victorious. I don't know about you, but I want to have the heart of a champion. Whatever the world throws my way, whatever comes my way, I want to go back to that verse and stand firm in my faith. I want to be alert at all times. I want to be strong and know that I stand with the greatest champion of all, the champion of love, Jesus Christ.